Hi, I'm Elizabeth Thiel, and today I'm going to talk with you about epilepsy in tuberous sclerosis complex and its relationship to the cognitive and behavioral issues that many individuals experience. First, to review the anatomy of the brain in tuberous sclerosis complex, and this is an axial image, I mean, an image going this way of an MRI of a person with, with TSC, and we're looking up from the individual's feet. So this is the left side of the brain, and this is the right side of the brain, and this is the ventricles where the spinal fluid is. As you can see in this, there are several areas that appear brighter than the rest of the brain, and these are cortical tubers. Cortical tubers, as we just saw, are located between the gray and white matter of the brain, and they vary widely in size and distribution. And we know that tubers are areas of the brain that develop unusually. So they form during gestation, uh, and so therefore the tubers an individual with TSC has, they're born with. They do not grow, they're not tumors, but they're tubers, areas that develop unusually. Again, look at that same image of the brain in the ventricles. You can see this little blob here. And that is a subependable nodule. And subependable nodules, we know, occur in about 90% of individuals with tuberous sclerosis complex. And as we saw, they're located around the wall of the lateral ventricle. They most commonly occur in the vicinity of the frame of Monroe, which is a little canal in each lateral ventricle that the spinal fluid flows through and circulates. And as we know, if they grow in that area, they can block the flow of spinal fluid, and those are called, then called subependable giant cell tumors. Subependal giant cell tumors typically occur in childhood, and for reasons we don't really understand, lose the propensity to grow around the age of 20 to 25. If they grow and block this flow, flow of spinal fluid, um, typically you get symptoms of increased pressure in your head, vomiting, headache, et cetera, but the presentation can be much more subtle. And this is the reason that until the age of 25, it's recommended that individuals with TSC have annual brain MRIs or imaging looking for the growth of one of these. And then this is an image, an MRI scan, again, an axial image. Here you can see a, a subependal nodule in the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle, which is calcified, which they also invariably do by um, late adolescence, early adulthood. And then here, right in the region of the frame in Monroe in the right ventricle, you can see a subependal giant cell tumor. So then that's the anatomy of the brain in TSC. And now turning to focus on epilepsy and what we consider the natural history, what occurs with epilepsy during an individual's life. We looked at this several years ago at the Hurstcott Center and found out the patients we had seen, 85% of individuals with TSC had a history of epilepsy. 70% have seizure onset the first year of life. And as we know, a third of children with TSC will develop infantile spasms, a type of epilepsy in early childhood that is often associated with subsequent intellectual disability. Of those children with TS who develop infantile spasms, a third have normal cognitive outcome. And we also know that if children do develop infantile spasms, vigabatrin is the first line therapy and the, um, particularly effective in, in children with TSC. When we looked at our population, we saw that two thirds of our individuals with TSC developed medically refractory or intractable epilepsy or seizures that were not easily treated with medication. Um, but importantly, over a third experienced long-term remission, including 40% off treatment. And this is really important because I often meet people living with TSC who have been told that they'll need to be in seizure medications for the rest of their lives because they have TSC, um, and that is not true. So the treatment of epilepsy in TSC in 2020 and beyond, anti-seizure medications remain our first-line therapy. Uh, seizures in TSC have a focal onset, so most of our medications could work. Uh, and there is some anecdotal experience on the efficacy, particularly of the newer drugs. And as many of you know, in the past 10, 15 years, we've had 10, 15 new seizure medications. Um, however, there have been no controlled comparison trials comparing one medication to another and in epilepsies, including in TSE. As we said, we do know that bigabatrin is the drug of choice for infantile spasms in TSE, but we know there are possible um, side effects of that medication. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about the mTOR inhibitors and cannabidiol and their role. For as you know, both of these treatments are now FDA approved for the treatment of seizures in TSC. Um, but what would medications don't work? Um, we know that dietary therapy can be very effective, um, both the classic ketogenic diet as well as low glycemic index treatment, which we developed at the MGH about 20 years ago. Um, vagus nerve stimulator can be very effective, and also there's an emerging role for um, responsive neurostimulator, RNS. And for many individuals with TS who develop refractory seizures, 
epilepsy surgery um, can really be a very effective treatment. And Dr. Richardson will be talking about that during this meeting. There's a lot of interest now, is there a role for prophylactic treatment? If we know a baby has TSE, can we do something to prevent the seizures from developing? And there's also a, a lot of interest in possible um, genetic therapy approaches. And Dr. Brakefield will be discussing that during this meeting. So turning to the mTOR inhibitors, first Everolimus or Afinitor. Now, the trial that looked at epilepsy in this enrolled 366 TSC patients ages 2 to 65, so children and adults with treatment-resistant epilepsy. And there was a baseline period that individuals had to have a certain number of seizures to be eligible, and then people were randomized, um, one to one to one to placebo, or not, to, and not active medication, or high dose or low dose. The medication was titrated up over six weeks and then 12 weeks on a maintenance dose. Uh, and we found that this trial was positive in that those on treatment had a significantly, um, statistically significant greater reduction in seizures uh, than those in placebo. So this, the, the side effects in this trial, the adverse events, were very similar to what we saw in all the other trials in clinical experience with the mTOR inhibitors, stomatitis or mouth ulcers, mouth sores, diarrhea, vomiting, nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory infection, fever, cough, or rash. So very similar side effect profile as is seen with these medications. And this trial, as you know, led to, in April of 2018, the FDA approval of Everolimus for TSC-associated partial onset seizures in adults and pediatric patients two years and older. So the first medication specifically approved by the FDA for treating seizures in tuberous sclerosis complex. Then turning to cannabidiol, uh, and this was the trial of Epidiolex or CBD for seizures in TSC. Uh, and this trial enrolled 244 TSC patients ages 1 to 65 years, again, pediatric and adult, with treatment-resistant epilepsy. This included a four-week baseline, and people had to have greater than eight seizures to be eligible to enroll in the trial. And this also randomized to three arms, placebo, 25 mg per kg per day or low dose, or 50 mg per kg per day or high dose. And importantly, about a quarter of the patients that enrolled in this trial were adults. This trial included a four-week titration of going up on the medication and then a 12-week maintenance. And the primary endpoint of this trial, what we wanted to see was what the percent change from baseline in the number of TSC-associated seizures was. As you can see on this graph, this trial also met its uh, primary endpoint as both the low dose and the high dose had a statistically significant greater reduction in seizures than those on placebo. The adverse events or side effects in this trial were also very similar to what we've seen in the other trials with CBD and seen in clinical practice, including diarrhea, vomiting, constipation, fever, uh, some elevation of liver enzymes, um, in particularly in those pa patients also taking Depakote or alproic acid, uh, as well as sedation, um, decreased appetite. Uh, and this trial led to, in July of 2020, the FDA approval of purified cannabidiol or Epidiolex for the treatment of seizures associated with tuberous sclerosis complex in patients one year of age and older. So now two medications with a specific FDA approval um, for the treatment of seizures in TSC. Then turning to the idea of prophylactic therapy, and is that a reality? Uh, and this is the trial that was done in Europe. There's an ongoing trial in the United States looking at this as well. But this was the European Epistop trial that enrolled 94 babies with TSC who did not have a history of seizures. Uh, and these babies, after being identified as having TSC, had monthly EEGs. And vigabatrin was started after the first electrographic change or clinical seizure um, or identification of abnormalities on the EEG. And 54 infants started on vigabatin prior to the seizure onset. Uh, and what was seen with this trial is that the time to first seizure um, was longer. If babies were put on vigabatrin to try and prevent the onset of seizures, um, they much longer, three times as long before the first seizure as those that did not receive therapy. And also at 24 months, um, we've seen that the preventative treatment also reduced the risk of clinical seizures. So those getting by gabitrin prophylactically, many fewer of them had clinical seizures, many fewer developed drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, and many, many fewer developed infantile spasms, suggesting that prophylactic therapy could be effective. 
but we also know um, that it, with TSC, it is not just the seizures. And our group at the Herscott Center, as well as many other people, has spent a lot of time looking at the association between epilepsy and the other neurologic um, symptoms of TSC. And we know that the presence of refractory epilepsy and a history of infantile spasms are significantly associated with cognitive impairment in TSC, autism spectrum disorders, as well as the psychiatric disorders or TAND, uh, including self-injurious behaviors uh, and sleep disorders. And therefore, I think all of us would believe that it's very crucial to control, control epilepsy in individuals living with TSC. Um, but there's much we need to know about epilepsy and TSC. Um, we don't know why people with TSC develop seizures. We don't know if it's the tubers, those areas that develop unusually, or what lead to seizures, or do they irritate the neighboring neurons? We also don't know if why tubers are all, all, are all tubers created equally. Uh, we don't think so. Many individuals with TSC have several tubers in both sides of their brain, but oftentimes it's only one tuber that's associated with the seizure focus. And in some individuals, could the seizures be related to a few or more subtle cortical or subcortical abnormalities? Could I have epilepsy and TSC not associated with the tuber? We also don't know if individuals with TSC, some are particular risk of developing seizures. So our group at the Herscott Center and many other groups worldwide are spending a lot of time trying to better understand and characterize the relationships between the tubers, the seizures, the interactive discharges on EEG, the genotype, what mutation is it, TSC1 or TSC2, and cognition, the behavior, psychological, tanned issues at TSC, and autism. So I'd like to thank all the people at the Herscott Center who have worked on really better understanding epilepsy and TSC over the years. Um, we have quite a team of people who spend a lot of time thinking not only about the seizures in brain and TSC, but all aspects of tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, so thank you very, very much um, for your attention. <laughs>